Good afternoon and welcome to day two, the second session of the Global Market Theatres. Uh, today's session is sponsored by Siemens Gamesha, or the whole day is sponsored by Siemens Gamesha. So big thanks to Siemens Gamesha Renewable Energy for their support of the Global Market Theatre. My name's Stuart Mullen. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the Global Wind Energy Council. And this session is one that's actually the closest to my heart of all of the sessions. Uh, this session is about Australia and offshore, offshore wind opportunities in Australia. So as an Australian, having lived in Europe for the past 20 years, it's, uh, it warms my heart to actually be in a place where we can start to talk about Australia as a possible offshore wind market. Uh, on, the 5th of, on Friday the 5th of August 2022, Australia's Minister for Climate Change and Energy, the Honourable Chris Bowen, announced that the Australian Government were taking the next steps in creating a renewable energy industry by announcing six proposed offshore regions that were going to have world uh, offshore wind potential. These areas will be in Gippsland in Victoria, which will focus a lot about the panel today, where the state government has already announced up to nine gigawatts of offshore wind by the early 2040s. And the other regions include the Pacific Ocean region near the Hunter, the Pacific Ocean region near Illawarra, and a couple of areas off the uh, Western Australia coast as well. Before we start today's panel, uh, the Victorian government's energy minister, the Honourable Lily D'Ambrosio, uh, has sent a piece to camera to kick off this session. So I'd like to in introduce the Victorian energy minister's Lily D'Ambrosio's video. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to say a few words about Victoria's ambitious offshore wind energy policies. I'd like to start my remarks by acknowledging that I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I wish to acknowledge them as traditional owners. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and Aboriginal elders from other communities who may be here today. From day one, the Victorian government has been working tirelessly to deliver the policies that we need to drive climate action, reach net zero by 2050, and unlock billions of dollars in new energy technologies. And we're delivering big opportunities for jobs, for investment, for innovation as part of the journey. Through our Climate Change Act, we were one of the first jurisdictions in the world to set a net zero target and to commit to interim emissions targets to keep us on track. And last year, I announced our target to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030, a target that stands side by side with international leaders and is delivering the most rapid rate of decarbonisation of any state in Australia. We've also created more jobs in renewables than any other state. And thanks to our Victorian renewable energy target of 50% renewables by 2030, we saw the largest annual increase in renewable generation of any state ever last year. We are now at the start of the next exciting chapter in Victoria's energy transition with our strong commitment to deliver a thriving Victorian offshore wind energy sector. In March 2022, we released our landmark Victorian offshore wind policy directions paper. As part of this announcement, we set an ambitious target of bringing online at least two gigawatts of offshore wind by 2032, with the goal of first power by 2028. And we've set ambitious targets of four gigawatts for 2035, and nine gigawatts for 2040. Studies show that the Victorian coasts offer the potential to support an enormous 13 gigawatts of capacity by 2050, which would produce five times the current renewable energy generation in Victoria. At 13 gigawatts, these offshore wind projects could generate 6,100 jobs. To get the offshore wind energy industry started in Victoria, We've already provided $38 million to progress three offshore wind projects. The Star of the South offshore wind project, Flotation Energy Sea Dragon offshore wind farm, and Macquarie Group's Great Southern offshore wind farm. These projects have the potential to provide more than 40% of Victoria's electricity generation and deliver more than 5,500 jobs. We have also seen a number of other exciting proposals come forward, showing how attractive Victoria is for offshore wind. 
But building an offshore wind energy industry is about more than just megawatts. We see the capacity to create new industries, develop new supply chains, and be the leader for our region and establish strong community support. Over the past few months, we've engaged in wide ranging consultation. This has helped us understand what's needed to build a long-term robust industry. We've consulted with communities, workers, businesses, the energy industry and port operators to help inform our approach. We are also working with traditional owners to develop a new model of engagement with renewable energy projects based on the principles that align with traditional owner aspirations for self-determination and economic independence. And we are giving priority to engaging local communities and landowners to minimise the impact of development and fairly share the benefits with them. We're also working closely with the Commonwealth Government to ensure that regulatory regimes can support the first offshore wind projects to be delivered in time to meet our targets. I look forward to continuing those conversations with industry to build the strongest offshore wind sector possible and drive billions of dollars of investment into Victoria. Victoria is perfectly positioned to lead the nation in establishing a thriving new offshore wind industry that will create lasting benefits for all Victorians over the coming decades. Our ambitious vision will only be realised through meaningful engagement, so we encourage and welcome your participation. We look forward to continuing to work closely with the Global Wind Energy Council and its members during this exciting and unprecedented opportunity for offshore wind and clean energy more broadly. So that sets the scene from what's happening in the, in the state of Victoria. The Global Wind Energy Council has been working with regulators and government ministries for some time now about in the Australian market. And I'm honoured to actually have a, a representative from the offshore infrastructure regulator, Mr Owen Wilson, who's all, come all the way to Perth to be here today to, uh, to uh, give, give us a little bit of perspective about what's happening from the offshore regulator's perspective. Could you please make Owen Wilson ready to, uh, welcome to the stand, please. Uh, thank you, Stuart, for the introduction and thank you to GWEC and the team for the opportunity to present today. Um, to continue on the theme I think that was set by Nick of, of the cinematic theme today, I think what we'll choose is the Baz Luhrmann epic Australia because uh, that's what this session is all about and that's what we hope the wind industry is going to be for us in Australia, particularly offshore wind. So the focus of my presentation today is going to look at the Australian market and to set some context for the, uh, for the panel session to follow. We'll have a look at where we are now. We'll have a look at Australia's aspirations and where we want to go. But first, just a little bit about the authority itself. So we're a new regula regulatory authority and we've just been established under a piece of legislation that came into force as of June 2022. Uh, our major focus is on day-to-day -day operational regulation and on safety and environmental management, but we have been working very closely with other federal government agencies in Australia to set up a licensing and regulatory framework which will enable offshore renewables projects to be progressed in Australian Commonwealth waters. So that's from three to 200 nautical miles offshore in Australia. Uh, and it's worth noting there that we do work closely, as the Minister mentioned, with uh, our state and territory counterparts. They're responsible for the thir first three nautical miles and for regulating onshore, including grid connection aspects. So if we have a look at Australia's renewable energy journey, if we look at where we've been, back in 2010, almost 90% of our energy supply was generated from abundant fossil fuel resources, and that's predominantly coal. We travel forward 10 years to 2021, and we see that renewables are starting to play a strong and increasingly important role in the Australian energy mix, with now 30% penetration of renewables into the Australian market. Um, but while renewable energy sources have progressively displaced coal generation over that time, there is still a long way to go to achieve our objectives in the renewable energy space. So if we have a look, quick look at what's in the mix... Oh, sorry, that didn't change. Let's try that again. There we go. And we break down renewables and energy generation further. We can see that wind and solar have been the technologies that have been really driving the step change in Australia. 
Uh, Australia has the highest per capita um, penetration of rooftop solar in the world, with about 17 gigawatts of installed capacity across the country, uh, supporting Australian households and businesses. To date, Australia's wind has solely been onshore, and we've got about 9 gigawatts of installed capacity in wind at the moment in Australia. But we need to build on that in order to achieve our objectives, which are on the next slide. So what is the objective? With a recent change of government in Australia, it's heightened interest in emissions reduction and also in the deployment of renewable energy technologies at scale. We now have a legislated target in Australia of 43% emissions reduction by 2030 and a net zero target of 2050. So how do we progress from the current 30% renewables to drive that emissions reduction and to achieve our targets with respect to climate change? This slide focuses on Australia's largest electricity market, which is on the eastern seaboard and feeds into major cities such as Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, our largest electricity market. The key highlights here are the forecast increase in demand from the grid out to 2050, with an expectation that that will double over that period of time. And that to meet that demand, we're going to need to deploy nine times our current installed capacity of grid scale wind and solar. So that's a total of 125 gigawatts of additional capacity that's going to be required in the Australian grid by 2050. Significantly, coal generation, which has consistently been our leading source of generation, is proposed to be completely retired by 2043 under this scenario. Um, and as these assets retire, large amounts of capacity will become available in the Australian grid, and that presents an opportunity for the offshore wind industry to harness. It's important to note also that these numbers don't include the western half of the continent and they also don't include the energy that's going to be required for behind the meter applications such as hot green hydrogen generation and providing industrial processes with clean energy. So you can expect that these numbers can, will only increase by you know, 15 to 30 per cent. So if we have a look at the role of wind, again this information only relates to our largest electricity market on the east coast, but you can see that on the basis of this scenario and these projections, deployed wind capacity needs to significantly scale up from the current 9 gigawatts to projected 70 gigawatts. Offshore wind can play a leading role in achieving this objective, with the ability to deploy at scale and in locations that are approximate to our large population centres and to establish grid infrastructure. Offshore wind, we know that if it's sited well, can also offer complementary generation profiles to the high degree of solar penetration that we have in Australia, which can smooth out the generation curve and can complement the high penetration of solar that we do have. So certainly there is a space in the market for offshore wind. So let's have a look at some of the challenges and opportunities, and I don't think any of these are unique to Australia, but we'll put them in an Australian context. Um, we are a geographically large nation and we have a grid that's built for centralised generation from traditional fossil fuel assets. So significant investment in transmission infrastructure will be required and this is being supported by policy at both the Commonwealth Government and a State Government level, with the Australian Federal Government having committed $20 billion in their rewiring the nation policy to modernising Australia's grid infrastructure. But to build this infrastructure we'll need a workforce. And we've heard from many of the, uh, the guests today as well as yesterday that workforce is going to be a challenge across a number of jurisdictions in the APAC region. In Australia, we are fortunate to have a highly skilled workforce already in place and we've got experience in offshore operations, in particular offshore oil and offshore gas. We also have a skilled workforce working in onshore renewables generation. And so with targeted training and reskilling, this workforce can be pivoted and built on to provide the workforce that the offshore wind industry will need to deploy at scale. The next is competition with traditional onshore renewables generation, and we did hear some commentary about this from the CEO panel yesterday. Offshore wind will need to be competitive with onshore options, however, cost is not the only factor to be taken into account here. If we look at the ability to deploy at scale, high capacity factors, potential for reduced environmental and social impact, the ability to locate projects close to market and close to established grid infrastructure, and as we spoke about before, that complementary generation profile to feed into the grid, then offshore wind has a lot of things uh, batting in its corner. But to deploy at scale, Australia will need a robust supply chain, and that comes with, um, that comes with targets, and that comes with a pipeline for the release of areas. 
And so, as we've seen um, from Stuart and from the Minister, there has been a, a release of offshore areas that's been announced at a federal level. It's being supported by publicised targets from Victoria, and we understand the New South Wales Government, which is our largest energy market, is also looking at targets in the near future. But industry also plays a significant role here. So with interest in Australia is increasing, developers with experience, with established commercial relationships who can attract the supply chain to Australia will be absolutely essential. And finally, environmental and social factors. Offshore wind is a new industry for Australia, for its marine environment and for its communities. The sector brings some novel impacts and risks that will need to be appropriately understood and mitigated in the context of the receiving environments in which these projects are going to take place. And collaboration between industry, governments and the research community will be essential to identifying research priorities, driving robust science and driving innovation in environmental impact mitigation and management. Meaningful consultation with communities and particular First Nations peoples, as highlighted by Minister D'Ambrosio, will be essential to ensuring that the social licence to construct and operate these projects is available in Australia. So let's have a look at the pipeline of areas that have been announced all across the southern part of Australia where we have world-class wind resources. Uh, so the Federal Minister announced these six areas which will be investigated for licensing over the coming few years. The first area, offshore Gippsland in Victoria, has already attracted significant interest from domestic and international developers, some of whom are with us today and who will be speaking on the panel after this, after this session. The current consultation for Gippsland closes on the 7th of October 2022, and we anticipate that first licences in that region will be granted in 2023. And so this graphic just presents the publicly announced interest in Australian offshore wind and transmission projects that we've already seen. So we've had 32 projects announced in the public domain and if we add up the generation capacity that those projects are putting forward, that's up to 45 gigawatts of generation capacity. Now we're aware not all of those projects will get built, but it does give an indication as to the first wave of interest in Australia and we think that's only going to build. So the numbers are there. Our Minister for Climate Change and Energy attended the Global Clean Energy Action Forum in the US last week to discuss how a clean energy future for Australia can be delivered, including the opportunity that's offered by offshore wind. Australia possesses world-class wind resources, a stable investment climate, a strong energy skills base on which to build. If we combine that with proximity to the Asian market, well-established energy trading partnerships, then we can see that Australia is pretty well positioned to become a regional energy powerhouse. To successfully develop an Australian offshore wind sector, the industry and governments at both a state and federal level will need to work together to address barriers and harness the opportunity before us. And something that's a key step in that journey is for the offshore wind sector to have a strong and united voice in Australia so that they can work directly with governments on harnessing this opportunity. So we welcome you all to come down to Australia and we hope, just like the film, it's going to be epic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Owen. That was uh, fantastic. Great to uh, see you in Europe. Great to, that you could make the journey. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, now we get into the panel part of today's session, and we have three panellists here in person and one joining us online. But I would like to introduce the in-person panellists first. So I'll start off with Michael Hannibal, the uh, partner at CIP. Welcome, Michael. Then I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Carlos Martin, the CEO of Blue Flow Energy. Welcome, Carlos. And our final in-person, Florian Laddage, the senior, bu senior business development manager at Skyborne Renewables. And I'll do it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe we have Mr. Yi Wa uh, Lu from uh, the head of APAC Corio Generation Online. Uh, Hiwa, can you I hear can, us? I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you very much for joining us. So let's uh, start the panel. Oh, first of all, could you please make our panellists feel welcome? <laughs> How rude of me. How very un-Australian. Thank you. Uh, so I thought that I'd start off by asking each of you guys to give a little bit of context about how you see, or how each of your companies see the Australian market. And so 
Uh, Michael, I know that the Star of the South project that you guys have been in, uh, speaking about for some time now. Uh, let's start with you to provide some context about Star of the South and what you, how you see the Australian market in general. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, in general, we, we see it, of course, with a lot of opportunities. In, in fairness, we started in 2017 in Australia. At that time, all the 45 gigawatt numbers, they were basically zero gigawatt. So, so I think it's fair to say that we were a, a true pioneer coming into the market, working with uh, three founders of, of a suggestion. And we have happily taken a, a good chunk of, of hard work, uh, both with federal ministers and also on, on the Victoria area, uh, to shape kind of and do this educational journey for them to basically see that offshore energy could actually be very, very complementary to the existing energy mix. Part of its complementarity is that, for example, around Melbourne, if there's zero wind on the west part of, of Melbourne, then you actually do have wind on the east side. So the complementarity between onshore renewables, solar, wind, and the, the offshore sector in Gippsland have proven to be there. So it, it has been a, a good journey, a long journey, a educational journey for, for many, but also with a view to a market that we need to unlock, because there are so many good reasons for unlocking again and getting offshore wind into the energy mix in Australia. Thanks for that, Michael. So you, uh, I'll turn to you now uh, from Corio Generation. How do you guys see the potential? How does Corio sh uh, sh shaping up in Australia? Thanks, Druid. Uh, Corio sees the Australian offshore market very, very positively. And I think it's really come in leaps and bounds since you know only 12 or 18 months ago. I think if we look at the, the progress made over the last year, you know, we now have um, a regulatory framework in place for developers to secure the seabed. We also have the first sort of state-based offshore wind specific um, targets, as well as a policy framework, and we hope you know, more, more states join. So I do echo CIP's uh, comment that you know, it's gone from sort of zero to many gigawatts very quickly. I also think that it's a perfect confluence of factors now that, that really is making offshore wind a reality. So I think it's broad-based political support in the communities for climate mitigation and for decarbonisation. Um, I think it's very um, bipartisan support uh, for offshore wind and also a very permissive regime. And I particularly like the way that the government has gone about it, which is not to try and figure out everything at once. You know, the federal government just figures out uh, or enables private sector to, uh, to be able to develop the seabed and then the commercialization and other challenges maybe we come on a, uh, will be taken on an incremental basis. I quite like that rather than trying to sort of solve the entire puzzle at once and it allows, I guess, a, a, a gradual process where perhaps the best uh, practices uh, uh, globally can be sort of imported in. So very positive um, and very hopeful for, to see this um, sector grow very quickly in the near future. Thanks for that. Uh, Carlos, we'll turn to you now. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so just as an introduction, Bluefoot Energy has been working in the Australian market for almost two years now with our local partners from Energy State. I must admit that uh, at the beginning, many people were asking us, are you crazy? Why are you going to Australia? Uh, such a vast country with plenty of resources, which is true. But we were very convinced that offshore wind uh, will play a very important role in decarbonizing the economy because you can produce very significant amount of power close to the load centers. And one of the key challenges in Australia is grid congestion uh, that we can address through uh, producing close to the load centers. So over time, um, this has proved to be the right strategy. Uh, I was in Australia in, 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 in July, um, and what was, I was very impressed about is by the level of consensus and alignment across all the political sector, um, different administrations, unions, local stakeholders. We had quite a number of town hall meetings uh, in the areas close to our developments there. And I was impressed by the level of support and alignment by, uh, from many different people. I think I, 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 I would join my, my colleagues in, in praising the good work done by the, by the different governments, um, um, which, I th in, my, in my opinion, is going to accelerate the deployment of, of, of offshore wind. 
And the challenge we have now, I think, is twofold, is, is on delivering on, on, on these plans quickly. Um, I, I believe uh, Minister D'Ambrosio was quite cautious in terms of the targets. I think we can build more and faster than um, what she, she, she announced, and we are here to, to support that. The other important challenge is to um, develop a local supply chain um, that can first deliver on that growth and second have a local impact in terms of um, community benefits, in terms of local jobs, industrial development. And we're also very active as a developer in bringing in international companies to the market who are very interested in investing in the supply chain in Australia. Yeah, th thanks very much for that. We'll get into it, actually. We'll unpack some of those topics in a little bit more detail in, in a moment. Uh, but Florian, I'd like to turn to you and maybe just even provide a little bit of background about Skyborne. I mean, maybe not everyone in the room has caught up with the, how Skyborne came to be and what you've been doing in the market. Sure. Thanks, Stuart, and uh, GWAC for inviting for this session. Very interesting to speak about offshore wind in Australia. Um, Skyborne Renewables was born very new 10 years ago. So uh, it's the former WPD Offshore team um, acquired by GIP, Global Infrastructure Partners, uh, US Investment Fund. And we are very happy to share this opportunity now to become part of this um, yeah, larger uh, investment fund. And um, this will definitely foster our um, development um, of the company and our project pipeline in many countries, and Australia is one of them. Um, maybe listen to our CEO in the, in the previous session, um, Achim berger Olsen was presenting this, but I think it's a different audience now. So uh, with Skybond, we have a 30 gigawatt pipeline worldwide with a focus in Europe, in APEC countries, um, and we will expand this. Um, several projects going into realization now. And for the Australian market, um, we stepped in um, after monitoring it for quite some years and uh, being a bit hesitant then really we saw the push into renewables and also offshore wind in Australia uh, starting last year with the offshore bill and that get, finally gave the quick decision for market entry. We have a team in Sydney and Melbourne now and working on various projects in the declared zone or announced zones. Great, thanks for that. Uh, Carlos, you mentioned that uh, the Australian government actually, Owen also spoke about what the Australian government have done and so we've, got, we've now got zones in Australia, which is great, and we've now got targets in Victoria, which is great. What other certainties should we be looking for as an industry? What can the Australian government, let's presu presume the, uh, the Prime Minister is sitting at home watching this session, wondering what he's going to be doing in Australia. And so what's your advice to him? What are some of the other things that we can uh, tell him what to do in Australia? Um, so very humbly, <laughs> I will uh, first again um, uh, highlight that there's been a lot of good work done so far. But of course, this needs to continue. Um, the most important priorities, in my view, uh, having nominated the, the six uh, renewable development zones is very important. We are very happy that four, our four developments uh, um, fit into these, into these zones, so the selection was, was done um, um, in, the, in the right way. Um, I think there's a number of uh, uh, pieces of legislation which needs to be approved um, following the uh, approval of the, of the offshore wind uh, legislation in, in, in the federal parliament. Um, it's very important that we uh, can see the first tenders on these renewable economic areas um, being called as quickly as possible because there needs to be momentum ongoing. Uh, we're expecting these in the uh, first uh, quarter, first half of 2023, which I think will be a very good timing to uh, kick the ball rolling and have the first uh, projects being awarded leases for developers like us having the certainty to invest in uh, site assessment um, and, and in, in consenting the, these, 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 these projects. Short-term activity is very important. Long-term visibility is also very important. We have already some uh, targets in Victoria, but I think it's very important that other um, states also approve uh, similar targets to give certainty for the long term. When we talk to industrials, what they're asking is for a stable a long-term market and having visibility on, on that long-term market is very important. A third element I think which will be, which will be very important is supporting uh, the local industry in making the right investments. Uh, uh, training uh, is, is very critical. We had a couple of meetings with the unions. They're very keen on, 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 on involving themselves 
uh, in, in getting the right people trained for this uh, new business. Uh, so all that requires a certain industrial policy that um, uh, will be important to, to, to put in place. And finally, regional collaboration is very important. Uh, I think Australia by itself can be a very big market, but trans 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 uh, Tasmanian Strait collaboration will be also very, very important. I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and the whole region, um, Philippines, Taiwan is a bit farther away, but it's within the area of influence of the Australian industry, can definitely be part of that regional play, uh, and regional collaboration will be very important. Thank you for that. Yi Wa, what about career generation? What certainty would you guys like to see in the market? Or what other signals would you like to see from government? Yeah, thanks, Jared. Um, I, I think if we just rewind a bit, you know, we have announced uh, two projects in the announced Gippsland zone, so Great Eastern and Great Southern, in total more than four gigawatts um, of capacity. And we're obviously looking actively at the other uh, announced uh, potential zones as well. From our perspective, we you know, highly welcome the Victorian government's overall uh, policy framework and offshore wind targets. We're hoping for uh, or looking forward to more meat on the bone in terms of the, what they call the implementation strategy. And that document is more, much more detailed. So it outlines what kind of support will be given, for example, for port upgrades and to support um, other supporting infrastructure as well as potentially the revenue model that all of our projects we're bidding into. So as Carlos says, you know, we, we just look forward to the more meat on the bone there. Um, I think step, to, to add to what Carlos said, maybe one thing we as Corio would really like to see is a holistic wholesale reform or reconsideration of the grid connection model and regime. You know, it was designed, the Australian system, if you compare and contrast it to the UK system, it's an open access system. It was envisaged originally when renewables or generation comes in an incremental basis. So you add a little bit to the network and you, and you undertake a sort of uh, best or least cost modeling to say, well, where do we build additional publicly funded or shared grid? Where we're at in terms of the um, energy transition is, I guess, a holistic change or transformational change where we're trying to decarbonize, you know, as, as Owen presented, trying to completely take out coal by um, the 2040s. And so the current, the, the current way that the grid um, framework works, it's not the best for developers such as ourselves to, to spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in potentially DevEx to take a project through because we don't really have certainty until the very end whether we have um, a grid or not. And also it's sort of missing some potential opportunities where the private sector can sort of collaborate or coordinate with the, with the um, grid operators to make sure that that grid exists. So I think some sort of, um, you know, wholesale reform of the grid is one certainty you'll be looking at. We know that there are various processes already in train, both at a state level and a federal regulator level. For, so this, the, the right conversations are happening. We just want to see them you know, follow through to the end. Um, and then finally, I, I'd echo sort of Carlos's point as well. We'd love to see other states announce their own sort of views or policy direction offshore wind and hopefully potentially uh, announce targets and coordinated policy. Yeah, thanks for that. And we'll, I guess we'll, you know, every market seems to be, grid challenges seems to dominate every market conversation. So it seems like that's not necessarily unique to Australia, but we'll touch on some of those challenges in a little bit later. But before we, I move on, uh, Florian, how does uh, Skyborne uh, Renewables see the, this picture in Australia? And what more certainty would you like to see from government? Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, I think with the ambitious targets of the uh, federal and, and uh, the state targets, um, it's, it's a pretty good start. How to realize this is next and key for that is, as Carlos already pointed out, have a quick start now um, and ensure that there's continu continuity in uh, project pipeline and that uh, requires um, the permitting process to also be very streamlined and in a sequence. So we would appreciate if, if this is really um, followed very, very uh, strongly also with clarity on the rules, um, how the regulations will be set and the criteria for potentially competition and the feasibility license process. Um, that's some key aspects that uh, we would like to have clarity in to really um, get the start going smoothly. There's a lot to learn from other countries. I think it's always um, uh, nice to, to have a look and um, think about the lessons learned in Europe, Germany and all the older markets. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Michael, uh, COP's view, I guess you guys were in the market also, like many of you guys have been in the market before. There was even a hint of a target in the, you know, when mm. they were talking, what I was, was setting the scene before. 
what's your uh, ambition for, what would you like to hear coming out of the Australian government? Yeah, of, co of course I could say some of, uh, or many of the similar things. What I think maybe we should ask, what we do we not want to see? And what we do not want to see is that they are blindly copying what have been done in Europe, uh, elsewhere, Asia, US, of bad things. So, so they shouldn't start up copying too much. They should copy the right things. And then they should simply be so proud, saying that why shouldn't we beat Europe? Why shouldn't we beat US when it comes to timing, when it comes to permitting, when it comes to consenting, when it comes to creating the right environment for industries, for knowledge, for sharing, for developing things? because it can be much easier. And, and if they simply just start looking at doing what have been done elsewhere, th then I'm afraid that they will repeat the bad things also. So of course there's a lot of lessons learned, but they should give it the Australian way and do it smarter and beat the rest with that kind of attitude because I think we need some new thinking instead of saying, yes, it's a new market, it needs to take 10, 15 years and then it needs to take another 10 years, and then it needs to, and then it needs to. No, th th they are great people. They are smart people. They are good, and they have done a lot of good things, so they can do it much smarter. Um, so copy the right thing, and then what we do not want to see is copying all the kind of bureaucracies, uh, all, all those elements that are slowing things down or making it less transparent, because I totally agree, predictability, volume, and also a flow of things is of course important. But I think it's equally or even more important that we get started and get started with a real project so that supply chain can see it's actually materializing. Because from it's basically, if it stays with a lot of talks and plans, then I think it's more vital to get started and then make sure that you do not do something while starting which is blocking you for doing it in an excellent way going forward. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, we're going to open up the floor to some questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, if you just raise your hand, if there are any questions in the audience. Uh, if not, we'll just jump into, or maybe I'll give you, I'll ask the, question, uh, ask the panel another question, and you guys could have time to formulate your questions, and so I'll come back to you for questions in a minute. Uh, specifically, we're looking at the uh, Gippsland area as being the first area, and there's an open consultation, as we mentioned earlier, which is primarily looking at uh, the MSP, like maritime spatial planning issues, I guess it's fair to say, that's what's dominating that consultation. Uh, are there any uniquely Australian challenges that we're seeing that's, that are unique to Australia that perhaps we haven't seen in other markets? And so, uh, Florian, I'll start with you. Um Regarding challenges and maybe barriers in, in the Australian market, I think it's uh, definitely the distance to other markets and supply chains that is um, a crucial effect to, to get started here. Um, we see the APEC market having experience, or uh, Asian market with, with Taiwan and uh, Korea, Japan now picking this up. Um, question will be if the su supply chain is close enough in that area that, that Australia can be seen as a, as a uh, region um, with these um, uh, countries as well. Uh, that's one point. I think um, there's also, um, I, I think the, there's greater opportunities than challenges. So, so uh, uh, I'm pretty optimistic that, that Australia will overcome that. Okay, maybe some of the uniquely Australian opportunities then rather than challenges. Are, are there anything, I mean, Owen mentioned about the, the oil and gas workforce that it's going to on mass move over to offshore wind. Uh, are there other opportunities in the Australian market? The Australian market for offshore wind, yeah. It's, Off offshore wind. It's, it's yeah. the size and the scalability at the first place, of course. Yeah. Um, it's, um, yeah, it was really good having a greenfield approach in Australia with uh, so such a vast area with good site conditions, water depth and uh, wind speeds and um, uh, close to coast sometimes. So I think uh, there's great opportunity. I will also be interested to see um, how quickly we are moving into floating, and that's maybe a, a chance and a challenge uh, as both, because yeah. we see that the fixed foundation projects might be realized first in the gypsum area and, and elsewhere, and then floating will come later. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities uh, in, in Australia, and nonetheless, it's the straightforward approach that the government on federal end and um, state level is doing to really streamline the process. 
Thanks. Uh, Carlos, what about yourself? You, do you see anything that's uniquely Australian uh, in the market that we need to watch out for as a market, as developers? Yeah, I think, yeah, Australian, but I think even um, site-specific um, um, challenges that are important to take into account. Every site is, is unique when you, wherever you go. And, and, and Gippsland, um, to, to, to your original question, has specific um, challenges that is important to take into account. Uh, if you haven't been there, Gibson is um, the um, it's, it's cold land. Uh, when you when you travel around, you go to Latrop Valley, you have these massive uh, open air uh, coal mines, uh, big um, coal generation facilities, transmission lines, and so on and so forth. And all that needs to be phased out and replaced with um, an alternative. And when you meet people uh, different with different profiles, everybody is very much aligned in that transition. And they see offshore wind as an opportunity. Now, when you, when you, when you drive around, you also see uh, some signs of opposition to onshore wind farms. So that support is there, but it's an opportunity. And we need to uh, take the opportunity to convince people that it's going to be good for them. Uh, so working very closely with local communities is going to be absolutely critical, listening. And the type of things you hear when you're there is we want to make sure that the infrastructure is, not, is going to be limited and it's gonna, not going to affect our landscape too much. So one initiative we are promoting, for example, is to share the infrastructure to connect to the Latro Valley uh, substations. Uh, there's basically 10 gigawatts of interconnection between Latro Valley and the Melbourne um, uh, metropolitan area. Uh, out of it is used by coal today. It's going to be phased out. But Latro is like 20, 30 kilometers inland from Gibson. So there needs to be a corridor of um, interconnection cables reaching that. We can all work separately and each build our own connection line. It's going to be a mess. And it's going to drive opposition. Or we can collaborate and try to um, build one single infrastructure um, to, to, to connect and minimize the impact. That's just one example. Um, in, in the same um, direction, people want to see jobs being created locally. And there's a big question mark about the supply chain. Where um, do we have the right ports, the right fabrication yards to build um, foundations to serve those uh, wind farms and so on and so forth? So we are visiting those ports, bringing our experience from other markets to understand where we can um, attract investments so that local communities can benefit from the jobs that will be created. But it's very important to engage with, um, with these local communities because their support is going to be absolutely critical. Things like visual impact. We have published a visual uh, simulation of um, our uh, Greater Gibson uh, offshore wind project for people to get familiarized with uh, what they're going to see and give us feedback about to which extent this is something acceptable. Meeting with um, um, uh, environment uh, conservation um, um, entities who are sharing their, their, their concerns, uh, impact on mammals, and well, many things. Um, so I, I think it's um, very specific, site-specific uh, challenges that we face, talking about specific about Gippsland, uh, that need a local approach. And in that sense, when we're talking about regulation, in our view, it's very important that when the government sets the rules for, for tenders, takes these type of issues into account. It's, it's so easy to try to um, uh, come from uh, lessons learned from other markets and teach people how to do things when the local approach and understanding, listening, uh, the local stakeholders is, in our opinion, even more, more important than, than bringing exper expertise from other markets. OK, thanks for that. Uh, Michael, uh, what about yourself? What have you guys seen that's uniquely Australian in either challenges or opportunities? There's, uh, there's definitely a lot of opportunities. And, and now we have been in, in uh, you can say, around our site uh, for several years and have basically completed all the studies for, for the environmentals and have all the data. Um, so you can say that there are certain things that we need to design and, and work around, but it's definitely achievable. And then it's already mentioned with, with you can say, harbors where you need to have loadout harbors. And, and, but that's, for me, kind of a little bit of a mechanical thing. Then um, we know how we basically can interact in the local area, because we, have, we are there and have been there for several years. 
and know how we can generate the, the service setup also. So um, more opportunities, but of course there are things that we need to work around and, and do the right way, making sure we do it uh, with, with full integration for biodiversity and and take all, you can say, stakeholders into account when we do it and when do it right. But we do have the experience for doing so, so there I'm pretty comfortable. Great, thanks. Uh, this session's kind of got a little bit away from us in time. I'll just see if there are any questions from the audience. If not, then I will then wrap up the panel. Um, are there any questions? No, so we assume that this has been a, uh, all perfectly understood. Uh, I'm a bit surprised that we've had a session on Australia and no one's mentioned sport yet, but uh, we can get back to that at another day. Um, you, well, I'll hand over to you to uh, your final remarks to the, to the audience. Well, well, thanks. Maybe I can borrow a line from uh, Ol and say, um, you know, I, I really do hope that the industry will be epic. I think there is a unique confluence of factors now and a lot of public support and interest so my message is, you know, please continue to give us your support and also give us your engagement with this virgin industry. Um, I think the more vocal you are, you know, this is for Australians watching at home, you know, the more vocal you are in terms of to your local MPs, et cetera, I think the better um, chances that we'll have continued political support and the coordinated policies to enable the success of this industry. And then if you are out of the industry, please reach out uh, and contact us, you know, all of us on the, on the panel, because I do believe there's a unique opportunity where you know, adjacent um, supply chain can pivot towards offshore wind. So we'd love to we'd love to talk to you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Florian. What about yourself? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I think we are very much looking forward to work together with the federal and the state government to realise um, at least some of our projects and portfolio. And uh, I think um, with the three projects that we have acquired from Australia's Energy and six projects in the announced areas uh, that will be pushed even further forward now. I think um, we are very excited to see this market moving and um, hope for a very good yeah, cooperation and um, that you don't do the same uh, uh, mistakes that we did in Europe in some countries. Let's hope so. Uh, Carlos, yourself? Um, so there are several messages for the um, authorities. Uh, keep it up um, and, and, and keep moving fast. Uh, the opportunity is very exciting and I think uh, the country is definitely going in the right direction. For all the developers who are not yet in Australia but planning to go there, uh, walk the talk, go local, uh, listen, engage with um, local stakeholders, have an impact, a positive impact, it's very important. Don't wait for the tender to come and, and place a bid and that's it. It's, it's very important to, to engage locally. Um, and for the broader industry, uh, look at Australia, it's plenty of opportunities, and let's work together, uh, developers and industrials, to make sure we develop a local supply chain that enables the, the execution of these projects, and at the same time that um, secures a positive impact for the local communities. Thank you. And then Michael, for the final word. Yeah, I actually think that there's a lot of developers and also in the panel uh, of, of really uh, a lot of knowledge harvested globally who are basically ready to come and, and uh, share that knowledge enabling that offshore wind can be implemented in, in the energy mix in a good in a really good way and, and I think even GWEC uh, are now uh, focused and have made a, a working group focusing, focusing on to condense the, those messages. So I think there's a fantastic opportunity. And for the short term, um, we, we have a spearhead project which could be an enabler uh, for, for basically paving the way and, and building the confidence and also uh, generate really early power compared to the wish list from Victoria. Yes, thank you very much. So that concludes our session today. Uh, I'd like to thank those watching online, particularly Prime Minister Albanese and Minister Chris Bowen, who I know are avid watchers of the any sessions on Australian offshore wind. Uh, but please welcome all of our, uh, please thank all of our panelists here today. And that concludes our session.